This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Uh, right now we have Robert Rodriguez. Uh, Robert L. Rodriguez is an ANS fellow and soon to be elevated from there and has specialized in early American coinage for nearly a decade, building the Resolute Americana collection in the process. He has made particular contributions to the historical understanding of the 1792 silver center cent and the 1776 continental dollar, notably with the co-authored publication of 1792 silver and non-silver centered cents, further studies of the silver plug contained in the Morris so-called silver center cent and his groundbreaking research performed at the Argonne National Laboratory. The Resolute Americana collection spans from the earliest coins and metals that have circulated in the British North America and leading up to the very earliest days of the United States Mint. Mr. Rodriguez has exhibited this incredible collection in several contexts, both in person and virtually. Today, Rob will be introducing perhaps the most cutting edge technology that any of us have ever seen used in numismatics in history recovered saga of the 1792 silver dean thank you thank you jesse uh it's a pleasure to be here uh at the coinage of the americas conference uh my colleague tony lopez and i hope you'll find this presentation both uh stimulating and thought-provoking at the heart of this uh research is a detective hunt. It is to uncover the mysteries of a small coin, a 1792 silver deem. It's also a search for the methodology by which these mysteries may be unlocked. We did not know what it would take. Today you will see images that have never been seen anywhere in the world. They are the first of their type. They were the result of a new scientific technique for this area, which is synchrotron radiation based X ray micro diffraction. You know, it just rolls right off your tongue. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, at our experience at the Argonne National Laboratory synchrotron. With that, I'm going to go to the next one. Where is it? Okay. This is, uh, in our opinion, the most extensive, intensive uh, scientific investigation of any coin in numismatic history. It's required over 800 hours of investigations, 150 hours of photo imaging analysis, another 50 plus hours of uh, scanning electron microscopy at two different laboratories, plus the introduction and attendance to the Argonne National Laboratory using the synchrotron radiation based X-ray microdiffraction to actually capture images from the subsurface of a coin of things that were on the surface that no longer can be seen. In order to accomplish this, it took five visits to the Argonne over a period from February 2018 to July 2020. Uh, we believe that uh, this coin is the design work surface for the 1793 half cent. And on top of that, it entails a potential love story. All this from this little coin right here. As you can see, there are marks on it uh, up here, etches all over the coin. This coin has been described as scratched, marked up graffiti for 160 years. But when I viewed this coin in January of 2016, these etch marks, particularly here and here, they started to talk to me, literally. And I said, I don't think these scratch marks are random. And I was using a high powered investigative tool, a five power loop that anybody could have used in the last 160 years. Uh, the person who tried to improve this coin 
was Edward Cogan, and in his letter of January 1, 1864, which is in the Resolute Collection, he describes what he did to the coin. So we know who the villain is. Uh, but he improved it to such an extent, he even said it's almost as good as new, and he sold it to George Seavey for the modest price of $205 in 1864. Uh, when we look at this legend, liberty, parent of science and industry, it has always captured me because it is the essence of what our emerging country was going to be driven by. Uh, these uh, etch marks were the goal of trying to unravel them. If we were successful in unraveling these etch marks, might they provide us some information, insight into our first coinage? To give you an idea of what X-ray micro diffraction can do, take a look at this Judd 9A. As you'll see here, there is no date. That date was effaced away in 1792. It has never been seen until here. That was captured on July of 2020. It took approximately 28 hours of scanning at a, and was recovered from a depth of approximately 50 microns utilizing a beam power of 20.2 kilovolts. When I captured this, when we captured this image, uh, it opened doors for us at the British Museum Mount Vernon. In fact, I even sent a note to a gentleman I didn't know, Tom Huckenhall, uh, curator of coins and medals of the British Museum, at the height of COVID to get something from him that had never been published before. And when he saw the image, he couldn't believe it. And he went to the uh, British Museum and got what I needed at the height of COVID, which I thought was very uh, wonderful. What X-ray microdiffraction can do is give us an opportunity to try and reevaluate or reassess things that we thought were settled history in antiquities. To conduct this research only took a modest capital investment of $2 million to acquire coins over various points in time as the need uh, presented itself. Uh, the research uh, to uh, conduct this, uh, proceeded in a couple of ways. First of all, we did uh, photo imaging analysis, and then secondly, we had two phases of scientific investigations. The photo imaging analysis began on February 16, 2016, and finished that May. We were looking to try and establish what these marks were any way we could. We did understand that when we looked at the bust of Liberty, it looked very similar to 1793 half cent, but we were not the first people to notice that. The marks on the coin, we had virtually no clue. So our first attempt was we did an imaging overlay now this is the second imaging overlay. The first one uh, took the Judd 9 with all the scratches and marks and overlaid it onto a Cohen 3. Then we noticed that there is a difference in the hair design right up in here between the Cohen 3 and the Cohen 2. And the following month after we did this in uh, February of 2016, the finest uh, silver dean became available, and so I acquired that along with a Cohen II. And what you're seeing here is that overlay, and as you can tell, it's perfect alignment from the hair all the way down to the bust. So we now have our first confirmation that this coin is related in some way to the 1793 half cent. I would like to acknowledge that Bill Eckbird in the numismatist of June 2017 wrote a uh, uh, column about uh, the hubs being used on both coins. 
As a result of our uh, photo imaging analysis, we entered the laboratory in December of 2016 to, to begin our uh, research. Along the way, while we were doing our uh, photo imaging analysis, the marks that I commented about here in this part of the coin and over in here uh, would become vertical reference line one and vertical reference line two. Uh, in terms of size, this one is about three millimeters in height, and this is about five millimeters in height. Are they important? Tony and I were looking at this coin, and we had this idea. What if we shifted liberty to the left and downwards? Might the lip here on uh, the half cent come into alignment on vertical reference line one. We estimated that we would have to shift liberty by 1.1 millimeters to the left and down 0.5 millimeters uh, lower. And we did this through a, uh, a plastic slab. So what did we get? Over here is the upper lip of the Cohen two half cent coming into perfect alignment then with vertical reference line one and the diagonal portion. We now have our second confirmation of this coin being related to the half cent. Put this in comparison, now you can see how uh, the bust of liberty on the half cent is lower by reference to that on the deem, and uh, I think that pretty much explains itself. Now we had to focus on vertical reference line two. If we moved liberty uh, over and down, this vertical reference line two came into perfect alignment on the hair croppings of the 1793 half cent for both varieties. We now have our third confirmation of the relationship. And as such, this is our term, we now refer to the Judd 9 as a design work surface. Another gentleman by the name of Rex Goldbaum came to a similar thing when he was evaluating an uh, 1843 mature head, large scent, and he what was used was the 1843 petite proof scent as with references there and all. And his article of July 2020 in Penny Wise, he referred to it as an engraved design model. As we both know, there is virtually no information about the designing process that survives from the mint. Even today, it's pretty scant. Now we had on the obverse, all these yellow boxes are places that we needed to investigate. Oh, by the way, all these etch marks are virtually totally illegible. You, cannot, you can't see what they are. However, we were very confident that this one right up here was the Peleus on the half cent. He said, we've got one. All the other areas, we didn't know. For the reverse, we had all of these other areas and we were pretty uh, sure about this one over here as a possible W. In quadrant four, we had a couple of marks here that we thought might be an H. So therefore, we were looking at the possibility that the W was shorthand for the wreath on the half cent, and this H that we thought we had would be the H in half of half cent. Uh, up in the top here, we had the beginnings of what we thought was an M, that is in quadrant one. Uh, but given some of the uh, elements that were not clear there, we couldn't really say for sure it was uh, an M. Then finally, we thought we saw the possibility of hearts 
in these areas. So the aspect of possibly a love token was beginning to enter our thinking. Thus, at this stage, we pose this question. Was this Judd 9 the design work surface to design the 1793 half cent? We had gone as far as we could go with photo imaging analysis, so we had to go to scientific investigations. This led uh, us to the Los Alamos National Testing Laboratory because a friend of mine knew Dr. David Teeter down there who is Materials and Science Technology Division. Uh, David thought that their scanning electron microscope would be able to unlock these mysteries. Unfortunately, we ran into some, shall I say, administrative protocol issues, and we were not able to go to the Los Alamos National Testing Laboratory. But uh, David proved to be a valuable resource in our scanning electron microscopy analysis. With that, I talked to my friend, Fred Holliburn, and we had done research together, and Fred said, why don't we go over to uh, American Assay in Reno, Nevada, where we could use their Apex Explorer SEM. And on the left side of the slide is, uh, there we go, is Salt Anderson. And we spent 25 hours and two visits there. And what did we accomplish? Not a lot. Uh, we got great photos, great images, close up with that SEM. We did confirm that our approximate measurements of 1.1 and 0.5 were pretty good. Through this SEM, the actual shift was 1.087 millimeters and the lowering was 0.49. So we, we got it pretty close. Uh, with that, uh, I talked to uh, David Teeter and he said, I want to, I uh, want you to go to the Colorado School of Mines to see Dr. Robert Field. Uh, he's a research professor, metallurgical and materials engineering, had been at Los Alamos for 19 years. And he says, I believe that if you go there, their uh, SEM is a dual beam uh, SEM, uh, to be explicit, a Helios Nano Lab 600i that I know we all have used before. Uh, and uh, in the right here is myself with candidate, PhD candidate Casey Davis, and uh, she's now Dr. Davis. While there, on our first visit, we captured in the W area right here where we think it's a W, we captured this uh, small trace element that indicated that we had a W. We were encouraged by that, so we flew back to Colorado again, and we conducted over 30 hours there, but we did not achieve anything more than that. We were shall we say, disappointed. But with that, uh, we did come to the conclusion and learn that uh, SEMs are great, except for one thing. They're only good down to about maybe less than one a micron below the subsurface. So what you're really capturing is just the surface features. Uh, Dr. Robert Field said, we had exhausted the capabilities of optical character recognition, and so that we should go to the Argonne National Laboratory. And we said, of course, except for one thing, we didn't know what the hell it was. <sighs> so we said, can you give us a name? And so we got Dr. Wenjin Liu, and I sent uh, Wenjin a cold call email with a photo of the coin, and shall we say, we were on our way to, go to going to the Argon. What is it? It is a huge complex outside of Chicago. It's a multidisciplinary science and engineering center. It's uh, sponsored by the United States Department of Energy 
and is administered by the University of Chicago, and its inception began with the beginnings of the Manhattan Project in the early 1940s. Uh, the image on the left that looks like a space station, that is the advanced photon source. It's 1,104 meters in circumference. Uh, it has 35 sectors, 70 beam lines that can do 70 independent experiments simultaneously. And up here is the parking lot. And the little dots there, those are cars. So that guys, it's kind of big. Uh, it is uh, a facility that generates ultra bright, high energy x-rays that are at a power level about a million times greater than that which you would receive in a doctor's office. Kind of like science fiction. This is what it looks like when we first arrived. However, before we could ever get there, we had to do a few things. It only took us seven months to get qualified to go into the Argonne. We had to take exams, uh, do all of that. And one little gating factor was because no academic institution or research foundation was sponsoring us. And I asked a couple and they said no. Uh, I had to provide a $2 million liability insurance policy for an experiment that had never been done anywhere in the world. So I went into the yellow pages, I looked under experiments never been done, and I found a place to go to. Actually, I called my uh, race uh, company insurance broker uh, because, hey, that's high risk. And Tony's wife was with AIG, employed there. I figured they insure almost anything. Between the two of them, we were able to secure a $2 million liability insurance policy, which meant that our research proposal could now be considered. Uh, our research proposal garnered a score of 1.75 on a scale of one to five, one being best. Uh, fewer than 40% of all research proposals score at that level. And with that, we were awarded what we thought was an incredible amount of time, 32 hours. Oh, by the way, as you go in here, this is uh, the experimental hall. Down here is a beam line hutch where the magic occurs. Over here, these magnets are huge. And they go around the entire facility and they accelerate the electrons up to nearly the speed of light. And again, we generate uh, x-rays. They're about a million times greater than what you would see in a doctor's office. In order to get this project done, we only had two, three lightweights, excuse me, Dr. Ru Jing Zhu, uh, X-ray diffraction uh, group leader, Dr. John Teichler, and Dr. Uh, Ru Jing Zhu. Wen Jin was our contact person. Uh, Wen Jin, when I sent him the letter of introduction with the image, the image of that coin captured his attention. And then when we had that trace element from the scan at uh, the Colorado School of Mines indicating a W, he was encouraged. But in our conversations, uh, he said, this has never been done before. We don't know whether we can capture anything. So it was where we went. Now, what exactly is X-ray microdiffraction? Uh, it's a technique that utilizes very narrow X-ray beams to perform localized studies of the crystalline substructure at the atomic level. At every data point in all three dimensions with submicron uh, resolution, distortions or strains in the subsurface metal lattice are measured. Millions of these data points are captured and they are analyzed. So as an example, this would be one data point. And that one data point creates these powder arcs. And they give us information about the nature uh, of 
the distortions, de uh, deformations, and the subsurface metal lattice. And so over here, we get measurements of intensity uh, uh, from what we're doing. Now, when we go through all of this, uh, each of these is very much like analogous to a pixel of a picture. And if we capture a number of these and we get the right resolutions and everything else, we get a picture. Uh, these are then processed through a high speed computer and it takes hours to do it. To capture these images, it takes uh, it's science and also educated guesswork. If to achieve a successful scan, if you scan too shallow, then what you're doing is you're getting a mix of information from both the surface and the subsurface information that becomes, shall we say, mud. If you go too deep, then you have uh, interference from the lower echelons of the uh, substrates that contaminate the image, so you don't get it. So you're trying to judge where you go in this whole area. Uh, X-ray microdiffraction and diffraction have been used at the Argonne before. They analyzed in 2016 a Tyrannosaurus rex, its little arms, uh, bone structure, uh, analyzed a mummy in 2017, and then 60 Minutes in 2018 did an expose on the scrolls of Herculaneum from the studies conducted at Grenoble France Synchrotron. Unfortunately, what they thought they were getting, they didn't get, there were some issues. And most recently, as of last month, it looks like they may be having a way to capture the uh, information. At that time is when our project entered the equation and when we went to the Argonne, there wasn't even a title for what we were doing. It is now called uh, Cultural Heritage Research. I should also add that Tony Lopez and myself are now in the Argonne database with all the other major research institutions of the world. So I can honestly say to our friends that Tony and I have been institutionalized. Now, in the uh, beamline, this is the experimental hutch, and the electrons, the x-rays come right in here, and they hit the target object. Because we're dealing with high-intensity radiation, we have to seal the hutch off. Before anything happens, we spend hours debating about what would occur over on the left slide, Tony and I and Wenjin are discussing the various aspects about where we should go for our first scan. Uh, on the right, the research team is discussing how we should do the uh, scan and uh, what would be the protocols. What was eventually decided was that little trace etch mark that we got at the Colorado School of Mines that indicated W, that is where we would plot our first scan. Here we are in here. Oh, by the way, before we uh, plop this little coin in there, it's only a $330,000 coin. No museum would have ever done this because it was too high risk. Uh, what we did is we, encapsulated it and helium atmosphere was pumped into this to add as another layer of protection. We did do a scan on a 1795 half team. We had no issues. Uh, later on in our investigations, we realized we didn't need to pump in the helium. Now, in preparing for the scan, over here in the upper right hand corner of the orange, uh, is a monitor. That is an optical microscope, and we are so close to the coin, and we're moving in microns, that it's very difficult to identify where you are on the coin. So, in order to guide us, we use my iPad. <laughs> and we look for trace marks that we could identify uh, over on the optical microscope. On the left-hand side, the camera is viewing. You can see the coin in the chamber. 
lights. We're viewing this at different angles. Tony is confirming some things here on our scan. And this is Wenjin and Rujing entering the scan coordinates. To do all of this takes several hours. Uh, now, Wenjin thought about what we should do in terms of a scan. And he decided that the initial scan should be a polychromatic X-ray broad beam. However, after a couple of hours uh, and tests, uh, he decided against that and went for a monochromatic X-ray beam for more precise measurements. Obviously, we all know what these are. Uh, the broad beam is analogous to like a prism that makes breaks up the frequencies of light. This breaks up the frequencies of energy. So it gives you a broader array. It didn't give us the information we needed. Uh, the powder arcs were not uh, good. So by going to the monochromatic beam, it's very much analogous to a laser. And with that laser focus, uh, we get better delineations. Now, as to what we were looking for, we have this coin, we have a little W, and the area that we're going to scan is three millimeters by three millimeters. Uh, and if we were successful, we would get a couple of parallel lines coming down and a couple of parallel line, lines going up that would match the other aspects of the W. And if we accomplish that, we've got something. So after 28 hours of, uh, 25 hours of scanning, we get parallel lines coming down, parallel li lines going up, this is the first successful X-ray microdiffraction anywhere in the world of a numismatic coin or an antiquity of this type. Uh, we were pretty excited when we got it. As we were doing this, uh, Dr. Denny Mills, Deputy Associate Laboratory Director for the Photon Science, was coming by with a number of people. And he just happened to be a coin collector, too. And so he says, how's it going? And I said, Danny, I've only been here for a few days. Excuse me. I think I can sum up the argon in three words. And he says, okay, what? Science and industry. And he said, exactly. That's who the argon is. Then I showed him the uh, obverse of the coin, liberty, parent of science and industry. He was blown away. Everybody who saw it was blown away. It captured the attention of people. People were coming by in the laboratory. How's it going, this kind of thing? Uh, it also caught the attention of Dr. Jonathan Lang, X-ray Science Division Director. Now, X-ray diffraction has been used in numismatics, but it's been in a, a very shallow way. Uh, uh, no more than an hour at a time, maybe once or twice. And what they're looking for is uh, microchemical stru uh, structures, uh, atomic signatures, anything like that, chemical makeup, but nothing in the literature ever went for to try and capture uh, an image. In the paper, there will be seven citations on numismatics uh, of X-ray diffraction. Uh, again, ours was the first to attempt to acquire a subsurface image. With that, our 32 hours of beamline time were gone. We're over. And Wenjin said, uh, by chance, can you guys stay over for a few days? I said, I've got some extra beamline time. And with that, little did we know, we were on the road to 600 hours in the laboratory, uh, on this project, and then we followed up with a second project that only encompassed 700 hours. So we got 1,300 hours in the laboratory. Our second scan, and I'll point out now that up here, we're going to identify scans as V for visit, visit one, S for scan, number two, scan two. And what we're looking for in a quadrant three is what we thought was an H. After 38 hours of scanning, we got the image on the right. We didn't get an H. 
And we're sitting there, we don't, we don't know what it means. We have been thinking letters for over two years. Our minds didn't shift over. And on the flight back, Tony and I looked at one another and said, we're a couple of idiots. That's not an H, they're Roman numerals. We also captured a little etch in the upper left-hand corner. We had to make another beam line proposal. So we did. And so for our second visit, uh, we were going to scan right in here between the H and the W in between. And that would be a 35-hour scan. And what we were hoping to capture was a Roman numeral one and a division sign so that we would have one divided by two representing shorthand for the half cent. Unfortunately, we lost beam line power all through here. About 20, 25% of the beam uh, went down, so we couldn't. But what we did capture, we did capture part of a Roman numeral one, and then we caught a couple of etch marks up in the upper right-hand corner. We didn't get the division sign. And then we checked an alternative form of designation for division is the colon sign. So we said, might we have a colon? We would have to wait for another scan. We continued onto the reverse, and now we're getting a little bit better at uh, how we're x-ray refracting. And the blue area uh, above the eagle is a 68-hour scan. Now, I'd like to point out that uh, over our scan here, in the interior vertical red line, everything to the right is what you can see. Everything to the left is non-visible. And so when we looked at the possibility of an M, if we continued up, it would have hit in the wrong area to make an M. So what we found was the engraver lifted his stylus, then corrected it, and made an M. We had a confirmation of an M. We also recovered an E on the other side. In the center area, we couldn't recover anything. The deformation uh, uh, burnishing was so severe that it destroyed the subsurface metal lattice uh, recovery. So Wenchin asked, who's E and who's M? And we responded, we don't have a clue. Then we went to our uh, third scan, and uh, down here in quadrant four uh, area, and what we captured was in fact a heart. So now we had uh, the idea that we're dealing with some form of a love token, but we have no idea. Now, for our third visit, we're now getting pretty good at what we call scan templates. These are our descriptions of how we're going to scan, our estimated time of scanning, and we would provide these to the research team. Uh, our first scan would be over here in front of Liberty, and that area there is a 68-hour scan. We were awarded 168 hours of scanning, of which we estimated we would need 148 hours. The difference between 148 and 168, that 20 hours, allows for a couple of things. Scan setups, two to three hours per uh, scan, and also some time for the possibility of beamline interruption. What we were hoping to capture is, do we get any information that might shed light on the area on the reverse where we had the E and the M? Might there be something similar? Oh, by the way, uh, we were holding our uh, scans. The last scan we we're going to do is up here in quadrant one, because we knew that was a Peleus. So why waste the time if uh, the beam line is going to go down? Now, here we have the scan on the left. And what do we get? E loves M. 
We've got a love token on both sides. Thus, on the scale on the reverse, we think probably something similar was in there. Whoever was uh, doing whatever he was doing to this coin, uh, shall we say he was a bit smitten? So, but we still don't know who it is. We then went to our second scan of our third visit. And now we're focusing on the neck area of Liberty. Oh, by the way, that number that you see there, 17, you could not see it with a magnifying glass, nor with a scanning electron microscope. What does it mean? We don't have a clue. And we'll leave it to somebody else to come up with an idea. So with that, we're going to move on to our third scan. And this one is not going to be exciting because we know we're going to get a Peleus. So to remind you, we have the etch mark here. We have the Peleus down here. Therefore, we're going to get a, a Peleus up there. Unfortunately, that's not what we got. We got this thing down here. And what is that thing? We didn't get a Peleus. We got letters. L dot J. And we're sitting there. We don't know what it means. Uh, we fly home. And the following night, I'm at dinner. Uh, my wife and I, my cousin David and Gina McEwen are there. And I show her this. And I said, we don't know what the L dot J means. And she says, could that mean liberty and justice? I'm just standing there, sitting there, dumbfounded that we didn't see this immediately. For over three years, we're thinking of an image. And when you're hit with something totally different, your mind just doesn't shift that quickly. However, with that, that started to uh, immediately make me think about another area. The 1783 Nova Consolatios. What is the legend on them? Libertas dot justicia. We're making the shift to the English on our uh, pattern coinage. So liberty dot justice. We also notice that the font style here is very similar to the font style on the Nova Constellations. So I wrote to my friend and colleague, Joel Rose, and uh, provided him this information, and he responded, this potential relationship of your deem with the 1783 coinage is extremely interesting. Your L and J interpretation as liberty and justice sounds plausible to me. The connection you have found between the coinage of 1792 and 1783 is truly significant. And then he added, he says, this pattern deem may even be the bridge coin between the 1783 Nova Constellations and our early federal coinage. All this from a few scratch marks. Now we continued on our fourth visit, and now we come back to this area where we lost all the beamline power, and in the bottom area here, very faintly, it's hard to see, we captured two more etch marks, and so we now have confirmation of a colon sign, so we have one colon two. We then scanned in our second one, we captured more of the wing, and we got another confirmation of a heart. So we're moving on. We then Wenjin, as he said, I want a pretty picture. So he scanned for the date. It was obvious what we're going to get. And then up in the uh, fourth scan of Liberty's forehead and all, we were hoping that we might capture some additional information that would help explain what the mysterious 17 was. Unfortunately, nothing came. Thus, we were entering uh, 2000. Uh, 2020, and uh, we were invited to present these findings at the Argonne National User Forum, where they have scientists from all over the country that comes there for about a week and a half, and Wenj and I were going to present. 
uh, in April of 2020. Unfortunately, COVID-19 prevented that. At the time we were doing that, uh, Todd Imhoff of Heritage called me and he said, there's a possibility the Judd 9A, you can acquire it. So on January 13th, 2020, I acquired the Judd 9A, the one without the date, and we thought that this was related to the design work surface process of the Judd 9. So the first thing we did was we scanned, uh, again, right in here where the date was, and when we captured that 1792 image, the one we started with, we were all stunned by its three-dimensionality. We had people come in and look and say, wow, look at this. Well, with that, we then wanted to scan the area in front of Liberty for the second scan. Why? The markings there are in the identical area where vertical reference line one is on its sister coin, the Judd 9. Unfortunately, the burnishing in this area was so severe, we couldn't recapture anything. We then scanned uh, Liberty's face just to see if we might find anything there. Nothing came. So we got a beautiful picture, or at least that's what we thought we had. We also gained some additional insight that if we hadn't acquired the coin, we wouldn't have. And what did we get? Here is a photo of the Judd 9, and this is vertical reference line 2 that's up in the hair, quadrant 1 of the coin. But under X-ray microdiffraction, we see we have, a pair, we have a vertical line here and a longer vertical line here, parallel vertical lines. You can't see these without this. And Dr. Rujing Zhu and I, we both looked at one another, and the light bulb went off. Vertical reference line two is not on the Judd 9A, on the Judd 9. So we concluded that the Judd 9A was an experiment on moving uh, the data around. We also looked for in that data area to see if there was going to be a leaf motif, very much on a large scent, but we didn't capture that, so we'd cut the scan short at that time. But with this, with no vertical reference line two on the Judd 9A, uh, we concluded that uh, justice was to be eliminated because vertical reference line two was for the hair crop. Thus, this is our uh, view of what the design process of the 1793 half cent was. Phase one is the coin that you see that we began with. Phase two, liberty.justice. Photoshop is wonderful. Phase three, the elimination of the date so you can experiment where the date placement would be. Phase four, the shift of liberty to the left and downwards, gates come down, this and then allows room for the peleus. We're going to liberty, one word, and we're cropping the hair. Thus, when we do all of that, both varieties of half cents come in, are in perfect alignment with these reference marks. For the reverse, we have the legend, which is carried over, and then we have the W that we argue is the wreath, and one divided by two, which is an abbreviation for the denomination of the half cent. We also noticed another aspect of all of this, the 1792 pattern coinage, all of the cents, large and Judd uh, one and Judd two. They're all using the wreath motif, spelling out the denomination and then using the abbreviation of 1 over 100, 1 over 200, and that is carried over onto the half cent and large cent 
for 1808 through 1808 and 1807, respectively. Now we come putting it all together. This is the result of nearly 600 hours of X-ray microdiffraction. Realize one thing, 98% of what you're viewing today is either non-visible or illegible. So I go back and when I think about my time in lot viewing in January of 16, when these marks started talking to me, I said, I don't think they're random. I think they were made with intention. I think uh, that turned out to be quite true. Now we come to the, f the fun part. If it only, why won't, uh, there we go. Educated speculation. Now we get into the whole idea of, come on, ah. who's E and who's M? While we're sitting in the laboratory, Tony and I look at one another and we say, hmm, let's make an assumption. Let's assume that the E stands for Adam Eckfeld. If so, then who's M? Could be his wife. We knew that he married Margarita Bausch uh, in the late 1700s, and the first little Eckfeld came out in 1800, and the whole lineage of Eckfelds came from there. We checked and we found in the Philadelphia archives that on April 8th, 1792, John Adam Eckfeldt married, drum roll, Maria Hahn. We say, we got the M. Uh, and so we were felt pretty good about that. Uh, I wanted to find more about uh, the marriage. So I called Chris Eckfeldt, seventh generation, <laughs> And he says, I don't know anything about this. You've got to talk to my uncle Johnny. That's John Jacob Eckfeldt the sixth, named after Adam Eckfeldt's father. And so I called him up in Lima, Peru. And I said, John, what can you tell me about Adam Eckfeldt's first marriage? He says, what first marriage? They had no idea. He was quite pleased to find out about that. He says, you've now added a small branch to the Eckfeldt family tree. Unfortunately, Maria Hahn never had any uh, children. She died in 1795. I don't know why, probably of uh, yellow fever. Uh, what is fascinating about talking to both of them, Chris Eckfeldt dropped out of college, uh, bartender, then went back, became a CNC machinist. And with that, uh, he helped fabricate the connecting uh, connector on SpaceX One that linked to Space Lab. His uh, uncle, Johnny, is a graduate petroleum engineer and geologist. So the family of Eckfeldt engineering genes are still alive and well in the sixth and seventh generation. So with these marks, might we reevaluate a couple of statements that have been, shall we say, discounted by the numismatic community, such as B.L.C. Wales and his uh, memorandum of view of Philadelphia in 1829, where he states that Mr. Eckfeldt is an artist and he made the first die of the men, and that's been discounted. Then from the October 1863 auction lot by Woodward, a half cent that was in the constant ownership of the owner from 1803 to 1863, and the half cent was given to him by Adam Eckfeld as a specimen of his work. So we are of the opinion that the, these markings are a missing link. However, my colleague Joel Rose disagrees. And he states that Eckfeldt did not become employed at the Mint until 1796. He was not an engraver. And he said, quote, would the Mint have asked a blacksmith, an occasional contractor, as opposed to an artist, or at least a skilled artisan, 
to design the half cent in 1792 or 93. Additionally, he says, as a love token, who's to say that those markings weren't added after the fact? And I said, those are all valid, good points. However, I asked Joel, have you ever engraved anything in your life? He said, no, I have. My father is a jeweler and electroplater, and at age five, he handed me an engraving tool with a little strip of silver. We put it into a jeweler's ball vise, and I scribed out R, L, R, my initials. They weren't pretty, but they were legible. Got news for you. That's engraving. And so Tony and I believe Eckfeld did not have to be a trained engraver, a designer, uh, but more of a designer and an artist who then handed his creation to someone who would more properly execute it, kind of like me as a CEO, handing my uh, PowerPoint presentation off to somebody else to get it done. Uh, as to the love uh, token idea that they were added after the fact, I have spent seven years looking at this coin like no person in the history of numismatics has ever looked at it. And in my considered opinion, the etch marks of the love token and the others are all done by the same hand. And by nature of the fact, we have vertical reference line one, vertical reference line two, that came before the 1793 half cent. And this is the first year of Adam Eckfeldt's marriage when he's in wedded bliss. Uh, we think uh, that all hangs together in our opinion. Uh, now, some people uh, would argue, I say, well, if it's a love token, why doesn't it say A loves M? Well, according to RelicRecord.com, it states a love token was used as a proposal of marriage. If a gentleman wanted to get married, he would engrave a coin with the initials of the family name along with the initial of the woman's first name, end quote. So uh, one could look at it as Maria is joining the family of Eckfeld. A final speculation is that Adam Eckfeld was an assistant to his father, and in 1783, his father fabricated the first dies for the Novo Constellatios, so he would have been familiar with the L dot J and also font styles and all. We fully expect this aspect of our research will be debated well into the future and should prove to be quite fun. This is Adam Eckfeldt. This is the 1839 gold medal. It is in my collection. Um, the entire Eckfeldt family collection is now part of the Resolute collection. It will be held intact and eventually it will be donated to keep it intact. Uh, they only raised $180 in 1839. To put that in context, that would be worth about 590,000 today. So he was very well thought of, appreciated, uh, and all. They also made some silvers and bronze. Those two are in the collection. Thus, when we come to our conclusions and final thought, the Judd 9 uh, is exactly that which uh, the bust and all that was used in the half cent that we uh, showed through uh, overlay analysis. Vertical reference line one, vertical reference line two are key reference lines for the repositioning of liberty and the hair crop. We have the liberty.justice discovery where justice would eventually be eliminated, providing more room for the peleus and the shifting left and downwards. We also have the abbreviations of W and one divided by two for the reverse. We think we've identified a potential link between the 1792 deem and the 1783 Nova Constellations, and this coin may be a bridge coin. This is some area for you numismatists to try and do a little bit further research. We are of the opinion, this is the love token of Adam Eckfeldt and Maria Hahn, and we believe our obverse and reverse design flows provide new information that was unknown 
or unable to be determined without the power capability of X-ray microdiffraction. Here we are, Dr. John Teichler, uh, Wen Jin Liu, Tony and myself. Tony and I could not be more appreciative of the support that we received at the Argonne. It was phenomenal. Without the capabilities of these physicists, only three, this project could never have been accomplished. So we come to the final slide, and I want you to know I'm dyslexic up here. That should be DWS, Design Work Surface. Was this Judd 9, the design work surface, used to design the 1793 half cent? And in our opinion, we come out with a resounding yes. And with that, open for any questions. I hope you have found it interesting. Uh, it has been an incredible journey of discovery of things. Oh, by the way, I failed high school chemistry, so I couldn't even get out of my science class. <laughs> so anyway. Oh, by the way, if any questions are un uh, unanswered, I've told uh, uh, Jesse, just send them to him and forward them on to me, and I'll answer them by email or phone call. Do you think the colon two half cent was the first variety of 1793 half cents? I would say probably so, given what I see on the Judd 9, because of the uh, hairstyle. Uh, that hasn't been focused on. Uh, the overlays that were done previously uh, did not use the same uh, Cohen variety that we did. And uh, so I would say Cohen 2 came before Cohen 3. You came before Cohen 1 also. Oh, no, I'm talking about the obverse. You, you early American copper guys get into something else. Uh, the uh, foreheads on both varieties are, uh, are slightly different. Anything else? Have you have you thought this, Chris McDowell? Have you thought about doing this on any other coins or metals, like maybe a continental dollar or something? Oh, you sneaky son of a bitch! <laughs> <laughs> uh, Chris, I love you. Uh, I will not comment on uh, the continental dollars. Uh, you'll have to wait for the second research project. Uh, the investigation into that is about five times more complex than this. And uh, uh, we have done groundbreaking research. I had a gentleman working with me, Dr. Robert Fagley, a physicist. Uh, I'd like to honor him. He won a, an award uh, December of last year that's only two levels below a Nobel laureate. And so he's a metal collector and he's on this project. We had some other people and uh, we'll do something. And uh, I think you'll find it fascinating. We have uh, one question. I'm sorry, Rob. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, we have one question online, uh, Eric Krauss. What was the subsurface depth that was targeted once the initial calibration was done? What, what, what was the subsurface? Oh, uh, the, uh, the beamline power, we, exper uh, we experimented with uh, different beamline powers and uh, anywhere from 12 kilovolts to uh, 22 kilovolts. And we found that at 20.2 kilovolts was the best outcome. And at that level, we would be uh, going down to approximately 50 microns uh, there. Uh, we scanned th uh, this coin, we scanned the Judd 9A, we also scanned a third pattern coin, a Burt scent. It's one that's in my collection, it has scratch marks in the uh, uh, area in front of Liberty's uh, face, and we determined those uh, scratch marks that, uh, were they scratches or were they uh, a plant planchet uh, issue. It was a planchet issue. We went down, uh, we scanned it because it was harder copper. Uh, we used 12.2 kilovolts that got us down to about uh, uh, about 10 to 15 microns into the subsurface, and there was nothing there. 
So it was a Planchet deformation.